this evening. I was told in my announcement this morning that uh, it could be taken a couple of different ways as to the way in which I expressed it. So just for clarification, <laughs> there are a total of 100 books, not 100 books for each member. But you can buy 100 books if you want to. We won't object if you want to buy them yourself and hand them out any way that you want to. But we have set aside 100 books total for the congregation. And if you want one, you will have to meet those requirements that we talked about this morning. Um, have to give Denise the name of the person you're going to be giving it to. It would be handed out to people who are not Christians, never have been. Uh, then you will have to carry through and hand them out to the individual. Uh, and then Brother Warren will be checking up on you to make sure that uh, you have. And then after two or three more weeks, he'll be checking up to see if you made. Uh, further contact with them and trying to study and uh, with them and if there's any way in which we can help and, and trying to convert that individual to Christ. Uh, so let's just make sure that we use this as an opportunity to teach God's Word to others. Uh, you know, we are to do our part realizing that God's word will not return into a void. It will accomplish that which he intends. And thus, uh, we don't need to worry about the conversion of individuals. We need to worry about doing our part in teaching individuals. And then we pray that they will have open hearts, that they will be that good soil that Christ talks about, uh, but that's not our obligation as to their reception or rejection. Our obligation is to go out and teach. And this is simply a, a convenient way, an easy way of trying to accomplish that. As we just sang in the song that we did about the kingdom being the vineyard of the Lord, that's what we want to discuss this evening and more willing next Sunday evening. The word husbandry itself is only found one time in the Bible. It is in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 6 through 9, when Paul writes, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. And so there in verse 9 is that word, that uh, husbandry. And that which I was just saying is emphasized here in relationship. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered. It's God that gives the increase. And that is the case. But we're looking at that word husbandry. Later translations, instead of using the word husbandry, state uh, that uh, you're God's field. And use that phraseology instead of God's husbandry. Your God's field. It's defined uh, by uh, Bauer, Danker, Arndt, and Gingrich as an area of land used for cultivation, uh, opposite of pasture land. And he uses cultivated land or field. Zonhidas defined it as a farmer, a tilled field. A farm. And so we start with these definitions, finding out God's use of this term, God's field. 
It is that land that's used for cultivated, a cultivated land as opposed to the pasture land. It is a, a field that has been tilled that's ready to be used for planting, the planting of crops. But we see in this, the, it describes the work and the care of Paul and others to plant and nurture the church at Corinth, that field, the work that they are involved in. And in our text where Paul says, I planted Paulus water, there's that work that they were involved in, planting and nurturing that work at Corinth. Jesus uses this a similar figure in Matthew, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 16, and we won't read that tonight, but he uses a parable of the kingdom being like a man that goes and hires laborers first early in the morning and then a little bit later and then later and continues throughout the day for those laborers to go work in his vineyard. And so Jesus likens the kingdom to that vineyard that laborers go out and work in. And so we see that the church is a place of labor. It's a place of work. Even as the song that we sang before the lesson, I will work, I will labor in the vineyard of our Lord. Well, that's what... The vineyard, the church is. It is a place of that labor and then subsequent fruit bearing. But I want us in this lesson to look at how the church is like a vineyard. And there's going to be about six points of comparison that we're going to notice in this lesson this evening and Lord willing next Sunday evening as a comparison between the church and the vineyard. The first of those is that a vineyard must be planned. A person doesn't just simply end up with a parcel of land that's cultivated and uh, that's a vineyard or with uh, the crops that are ready. That doesn't take place. There has to be some planning that's involved in it. Some design that here's what we're going to do. And there's other areas that we'll look at in relationship to that planning, actually, and relationship to it. But it does have to be planned. God planned the church. As Paul would write to the Ephesian brethren in chapter 3, verses 10 and verse 11, that to the intent that now to the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is not saying as many times it's used or maybe misused might be the proper term that the church is to make known the manifold wisdom of God. Now that aspect may be true but that's not what Paul has in mind here. What Paul is dealing with when he says that in, to the intent that now the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, he's saying that it, the church is the manifold wisdom of God. That God had planned before the world began. The eternal purpose of God was the church. And here's the wisdom of God in the salvation of man and the church's role and plan in that salvation of man. And so here's the purpose. Yes, even before the creation of the world, God planned a way in which to save sinful mankind. When man sinned in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't a surprise to God. He wasn't caught off guard as some have taught through the years. Instead, God knew it. And God had already established a way in which He was going to reconcile man back to Himself. And so when man sins, 
There's certain curses that God places upon man, upon woman, and upon Satan. And in relationship to Satan, He tells Satan about the seed of woman who's going to come and while He says to Satan, you will bruise his heel, yet he will bruise your head. In other words, he is going to destroy your power. Or was it there at the very beginning of time when man sinned, God starts revealing that purpose that He had planned. That wisdom that He established before the creation of how the church is going to come into existence. And Christ is going to die upon the cross. And as he conti we continue through history, we see that plan being worked out by God. Truly, the manifold wisdom of God is seen in the church of our Lord. In 2 Timothy, the first chapter, in verse 9, Paul says, Who saved us and called us with a holy calling. We talked about that calling of God this morning a little bit in relationship to the church. Well, here is this holy calling that we've been called to. Not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Here is God's plan before the world began. That here's the purpose of God being seen in Jesus Christ and His dying upon the cross for sinful mankind. And so, the church is not some afterthought. Premillennialism comes along and says that God was cut off guard. That He sent His Son into this world and that Jesus' plan was to establish a kingdom. But... Here's the, this old Jewish nation. And they rejected Jesus. And because of that rejection of Jesus, Jesus was not able to establish His kingdom. And so, as a substitute for that kingdom that He planned to establish, He instead had to establish the church. It was never in God's plan, God's design for the church to exist. But he had to do something because Jewish rejection of Jesus. Well, such hogwash is hard to fathom that man would come up with such a, a thought in relationship to God. That God had planned something and here old puny man has the ability to stop the plans of God. And that God had lied all through those ages. He didn't know what He was talking about. <clears throat> Truly, the church was not an afterthought or a substitute plan. It was the plan that God established. That God had planned prior to the world's beginning. Just as a vineyard must be planned, so God planned the church in eternity. And we saw as you go through and you study the Scriptures how that God starts establishing that plan to bring about the church and the establishment of the church to save sinful mankind. But vineyards also must be purchased. We go out and there's a field out there that we want to put a vineyard in. We're going to have to spend some money to buy that vineyard. And so it has to be purchased. Jesus paid the purchase price for the church. In Acts 20th chapter verse 28, it says, "...to take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers." to feed the church of God which He hath purchased with His own blood. Here's the purchase price of the church of God. What is it? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. He purchased, He bought the church. We generally consider the value of something by the price that we pay for it. Every once in a while, we're surprised uh, by the value of something. Maybe we didn't spend a great deal of money on it. 
and all of a sudden we find out that it's worth a great deal more, or sometimes a great deal less. Probably a great deal less, a lot more than uh, often than it being worth more. But generally, we assign the value to that object by the price that is paid for it. Here's the church. And we start seeing the value of the church. Is the church worth anything? Is it of any value? You know, back a few decades ago, we went through this uh, period of time in which people were saying, yes to Jesus, but no to the church. Well, if Jesus used the purchase price of His own blood to purchase the church, then we start seeing the value of the church and to try to say that yes, I'll take Jesus, but no, I don't want the church is foolishness. You can't have Jesus without the church. That's what He bought. He bought it with His own blood. He recognized the value of it that it was valued, valued enough that He would give His life for it. And yet still we see individuals denigrating the church by our Lord today. That it has very little value. Notice the way in which they treat the worship of the church. Notice how they treat the work of the church. The organization of the church. The worship of the church. They denigrate the value of the church. They don't consider it that precious institution that was bought by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But because He paid that purchase price, just as if I go out and buy an object and I pay the money for that object, that object becomes mine. So it is with the church. It belongs to that one who paid the purchase price. He owns the church. And thus we should not be surprised when we would read in Matthew 16 and verse 18 of His promise to build the church when He says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, it is that bedrock of faith that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon that bedrock of faith, I will build, Jesus says, my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I'm going to build... Not just a church out here. I'm going to build my church. It belongs to me. I own it. No one else. Uh, when anything happens within the Roman Catholic Church, we'll start hearing about uh, from the news media about how the Pope is the head of the church. Well, he might be head of the Roman Catholic Church, but he's not the head of the, of the church. The one that we read about in the Bible. Jesus is the one who owns that. Jesus is the head of it. It belongs to Him. And no one else. It doesn't belong to us. It doesn't belong to the elders. It doesn't belong to the preacher. It doesn't belong to you. And yet, how many times do we hear members of the church talking about my church or your church? Why not Christ's church? That's who it belongs to, not me, not you. That's why Paul in that salutation of the Roman letter would state in Romans 16 and verse 16, salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. He's recognizing in that statement that here's the church and it belongs to Christ. That's the idea of the church of Christ. He's showing the possessive nature of it. And here's something that belongs to Christ. As far as we are concerned though, 
For we are laborers. We're not owners. We labor in that vineyard. We labor in that church. The passage that we read and serves as our text in 1 Corinthians 3, in verses 6 and verse 7, Paul says, I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. I planted Apollos water. We worked in that vineyard. We labored in that vineyard. But the vineyard was not ours. It was God who gave the increase. We're just laborers in that work. In 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, we see the aspect of stewardship and how that we are stewards when Paul says, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. The word steward literally means a house ruler. Ruler of the house. It was a slave, generally, who took, took care of all of the affairs dealing with his master's house. Had to be a very trusted servant. Slave, in reality. For if he wasn't trusted and could not be trusted, he could ruin the master's reputation. He could destroy the master. And so it was required in these stewards that a man be found faithful. Well, he's saying here, we are ministers of Christ. We're stewards of the mysteries of God. And if we go through and study the aspect of the mysteries of God, we would find very simply that those mysteries of God is that plan that God had set forth from the beginning of the world that He had planned prior to the existence of this world as to the salvation of all men in Jesus Christ. And thus He would tell Abraham in Genesis 12 and verse 3, that in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. How was that blessing going to come? It was going to come in Jesus Christ. Now then, we are ministers of Christ. Thus, we are stewards. We have to treat faithfully and deal faithfully with that mystery of Christ, that mystery of God. The idea of a mystery is very simply that which is, has been hidden but now has been made known. In the Old Testament, it was shadows, it was types of the church and of Christ. But now then, with Christ, it was actually revealed. And we can come to know it. A good illustration of that would be the Ethiopian unit. Here he was, he's been to Jerusalem. He's on his way back home now, riding in his chariot, reading Isaiah the 53rd chapter. And as Philip comes up to him, he hears him reading that great, marvelous chapter of the suffering servant. And so he asks him, do you understand what you read? And the eunuch said, how can I except some man tell me? Is the prophet talking about himself or some other man? I don't understand. And truly, if you read Isaiah the 53rd chapter by itself without any knowledge of Christ, you wouldn't understand. Because it was setting forth Christ and His sacrifice, His life, the death that He's going to die upon Calvary's tree, the fact that He was dying a vicarious death. He's setting forth all of those aspects and many more. But He's doing it in types and figures. And so, no, that Ethiopian could, did not understand what he was reading. He needed someone to show him. And so Philip began at the same Scripture and preached unto him Jesus. What well, was it? He was being a steward of the mysteries of God. Faithfully revealing that plan that God had established of salvation of man through Jesus Christ. And it caused the Ethiopian, uh, when they came upon some water, 
to say, see, here's water. What does it mean to be baptized? Philip knew the need of faith, though. And so uh, he asked the question, well, if you believe, you can. And the Ethiopian makes that great confession of faith. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And based upon that, then Philip baptized him. And the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Why? Because he had salvation. Philip had been a faithful steward of the mysteries of God. We are stewards. But a steward is not the owner of it. Just as that slave did not own the possessions of his master, the master was the owner. The slave was simply a servant who took care of that which was his master. So it is with us. We are to be faithful stewards of that which God has given unto us. But far too many today, instead of wanting to hear what God says on the matter, they want to hear, well, what does the preacher say? Or what does the elders say? Or we'll go out and we'll tell people, well, my preacher says such and such. Or the elders where I go say such and such. Or we hear so many times, well, my opinion is such, I believe such and such. Instead of going and appealing to the Master and saying, here's what the Master says. Here's what the owner says. God's Word says this. And then us bringing our lives in subjection to and in harmony with God's will. What so many want to do is change God's will and alter that will to make it conform to the wills of man. That's the whole idea behind in reality. Join the church of your choice that we've heard throughout the years. What is it? Just find a place that satisfies you. It's whatever you want. And instead of us being the steward, we want to be, make ourselves the owner. And if this place over here, this denomination doesn't satisfy us, then we'll go to some other denomination. And We'll keep looking around until we find something that satisfies us instead of satisfying God. And people fail to teach others that you have to bring your will, your wishes, your life in harmony with what God's Word says instead of trying to change and alter God's Word to fit your desires. Why? Because Christ is the one who purchased the church. He is the owner and not us. But then also, vineyards have to be planted. There's labor that takes place. The church had to be planted as well. It took place at Jerusalem on Pentecost. It was prophesied in the long ago, for example, in Isaiah 2, verses 2 and verse 3. It says that it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And He will teach us of His ways, and we will walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He sets forth when it's going to be established. It's going to be in the last days. The last days began on Pentecost of Acts, the second chapter. As we would see as Peter began his sermon in teaching the Jews he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. That in the last days, and so he identifies, here's these last days that Joel prophesied about. This that is taking place now is the fulfillment of what Joel said about the last days. 
But if it's the fulfillment of that which Joel spoke of in his last days, it's also the fulfillment of the last days in relationship to what Isaiah wrote. That in the last days, he said that that church is going to be established, the Lord's house, and that house is the church. It is that temple of God we would see in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. It's the house of the Lord. It was established on that day of Pentecost. It says that God's law, His Word, is going to go forth out of Jerusalem or from Jerusalem. That Word that's going to teach us the ways of God. That's going to instruct us as to how to walk in His paths. And yes, on that day of Pentecost in Acts second chapter at Jerusalem, they began proclaiming that way of God and how that we can be in a right relationship with Him and how that we can walk in His paths and in telling us how we can become saved and become a child of God, it says in verse 42 that they continued in the apostles' doctrine. They continued teaching man. God's law. And so here in Isaiah, long ago, Isaiah starts prophesying of this establishment of the church when it's going to be planted. In Luke, the 24th chapter, you see again Jesus in making that preparation. We're not going to take the time this evening, but we could show how that John the Baptist and Jesus both began making preparations for the planning, the establishing of the church. John and Jesus both went out with the message that the kingdom of God is at hand. It's near. What is it? It's upon us. And so they began making preparations and the teaching that Jesus gave during those three and a half years was preparing for that establishment of the church. And now then, after His death and resurrection from the grave, He comes to His apostles and He says unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and arise from the dead the third day. The idea of suffering there has reference specifically to His death upon the cross. So it, it, was, it behooved Christ to die upon the cross, to be raised from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye, the apostles, are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Here's Jesus telling the apostles that all the world is to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you, the apostles, are going to be my witnesses of the things that have taken place. And you are to preach repentance and the remission of sins among all nations. Where is it to begin? It was to begin at Jerusalem. And so as you go to Acts, the second chapter, you see the establishment of the church. How that the apostles were endued with power from on high in verses 1 through verse 4. That the Holy Spirit comes upon them and that they begin speaking with tongues. That is a miraculous speaking with tongues in that they were able to speak languages that they had never studied. There was a gathering of the crowd in verses 5 through verse 13. Some of them mocked, saying, These men are full of new wine. Others wondering, what is the, What's the meaning of this? What's taking place? And so Peter in verse 14 stands up with the eleven, the other apostles. And he gives a brief defense. These men are not drunk, as some of you suppose. Think it's but six, uh, the third hour of the day. That's nine o'clock in the morning. It's too early for us to be drunk. But this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And he began setting forth the church and how that Christ had died for their sins. 
But God raised him up from the dead and showed him openly. And he says we're witnesses. All these the apostles were witnesses of these things. And now then, when they were pricked in their hearts, Peter tells them, you need to repent. And you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. He was establishing the church. And about 3,000 souls obeyed the Gospel on that day. They were baptized as they received the Word. They were baptized. Same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. We're told in verse 41. In verse 47, it says that they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church those that were being saved. Those individuals who hearing God's Word believing that Word, repenting of their sins, making that confession of their faith in Jesus Christ, baptized in water for the forgiveness of their sins, God added them to the church. What happened? That church had been planted. There was the establishment of the church at that point in time. But also, we would, need, we would see that God is that husbandman with the good seed. In Luke the 8th chapter, Jesus gives the parable of the sower. The man goes out and sows the seed. And as He explains it in verse 11, He talks about now the parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. Here is God's Word. That good seed. That good seed that has power to save our souls. Remember we read in James the first chapter in verse 21 this morning, how that we are to receive that implanted Word, the engrafted Word the King James uses. It is a Word which has been planted in the hearts of man. What is it? That sower has gone out and sowed the seed. And he says that that implanted Word is able to save your souls. Why? Because it has the power of God. It is the power of God. Romans 1 and verse 16. As Paul would say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Here is this Word of God, which when planted into that good and honest heart, will bring about the salvation of souls. And so, those who are good stewards are going to go out and they're going to evangelize. And they're going to edify others. They will do that part of evangelism. As Jesus told His apostles and applies to us as well, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16 verse 15. It applies to us as well. We're to go out into the world. That world that's about us. That lives around us. That we live in. And we are to preach the Gospel. Why? Because it is that good seed which is able to save our souls, which is the power of God unto salvation. And so go out and preach that Gospel to a lost and dying world. In the first century, we see that each and every Christian recognized this responsibility, his own personal responsibility to carry that message to a lost and dying world. And so it records in Acts 8 and verse 4, upon the persecution that arose over Stephen's death, led by Saul, that therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the Word. They wanted to sow that seed of the Kingdom of God. They wanted to work. They wanted to labor in the vineyard of our Lord. We sang the song, I will work, I will labor in the vineyard of our Lord. But do we? Are we out in that working, laboring within God's kingdom to sow the seed of the kingdom? To scatter that good seed within the hearts and lives of individuals? then we also need to edify others. Paul told Timothy that the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful 
men who shall be able to teach others also. Paul says, here you are, Timothy. You've studied under me. I have delivered you this message, this good seed that is able to save people's souls. You've learned that message. I've taught them these things to you. Now then, it's your responsibility and your obligation to take that same message and teach it to other Christians who will also be faithful in that discharge of their duties as a steward of that manifold wisdom of God to teach others as well. There is edification that is taking place. Paul edified Timothy and he's telling Timothy, you edify others. You build them up and strengthen them so that they will know God's Word and be able to live God's Word and be able to teach others as well. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, in verses 12, 11 and verse 12, Paul says that he get, God gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. There is that building up, that strengthening of the church. And so we take that Word of God, which is able to save our souls, the power of God unto salvation, and we take it out into a lost and dying world and teach others. And then in that, we take that same Word and we build each other up. We strengthen one another. Why? So that at the end of our lives we will be found faithful. And that we will be that one who was a faithful steward of the manifold wisdom of God. And we will thus hear the message, well done, thou good and faithful servant. If you're not a Christian this evening, then why not obey that truth of God's Word? Do that which God wants you to do as we've already enumerated this evening in relationship to becoming a Christian. If you're not living the faithful Christian life, you're not being that faithful steward of God's Word, why not come back and be faithful in your life, teaching others and edifying others, and yes, living that life that is a life of dedication and service unto God. If you need to come this evening, we would plead with you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song.